Jedi names of Allah. Each poster meticulously presents the Arabic name, pronunciation and English translation, embodying the essence of our creator. Elevate your surroundings with these high quality designs that not only serve as art, but also offer a glimpse into the profound beauty of Islamic culture. Immerse yourself in the collection and unveil the magnificence of the 99 names. Links in the description box. Oh my gosh, are we done? <laughs> Come on. Finally. It has no continuity, and I keep seeing literally the worst arguments I have ever heard. Yeah, I'm sure he's going to go into the continuity argument later. He has to go into the continuity argument, Bobby, because that is the most important thing. If you're claiming to be the tradition that fixes the two prior traditions, you have to have some kind of continuity. And saying vague things like worship one God is not going to be good enough. ...in his video, so therefore I'm going to save this as well and keep it as short as possible. The question is simply, which continuity does Christianity truly have with, for example, Abraham or Noah? Those prophets surely were not Christian. They were not praying to Jesus Christ. They were not believing in a trinity. Those prophets clearly were pure monotheists, i.e. Muslim. Monotheist and Muslim are not synonymous. As you later point out, Muslim means to submit. The impression being submit to Allah. Uh, monotheist is actually a Greek term. I thought you guys didn't like Greek philosophy. I thought this was some kind of syncretism you did not favor in the Christian system. So why are you using monotheism? Uh, the Bible never uses the word monotheism. And monotheism has nothing to do with anything. You could be a pagan that worships only one god. But worshiping one god is the high mark for you guys. So I suppose that the uh, pagans of Canaan that Elijah slaughtered because they were worshiping Baal Hadad, because they were only worshiping one god, Baal Hadad, they were actually Muslims. And the prophet Elijah, or Elias, shouldn't have done that, according to you at least. Hey, so he shows Ibrahim here as some sort of example for Haram level. Uh, speaking of Haram, both you and that guy have tattoos, which are Haram in Islam. But please, continue. Tell us what is Haram and what's not Haram argumentation. It is true, after all, the word Bible is not mentioned in the Bible. The word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible either. Hold on a minute. If the word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible, and that is somehow proof that it's not a proper doctrine, the word Tawhid is not in the Quran, technically, so you don't have Tawhid and you don't have monotheism, because those words don't exist in the scripture. But apart from the Trinity, why can't somebody believe in the Bible? Why does everything have to hang up on the Trinity? And why is it the only things that are ever mentioned? in these debates with Christians and Muslims. is monotheism versus the Muslim idea of what the Trinity is. You know, for 500 years, the Aryans were the plurality in many areas and the majority in many areas when competing with the Trinitarian churches, and the Aryans would not have agreed with Islam. Most Aryans, although there were quite a variety of schools of different Aryanisms, so you had some Aryanism or some Aryan beliefs, sorry, that uh, thought Christ was created ex nihilo, as the Muslims believed, that he was created out of nothing. But then you had other groups like the semi-Aryans, such as Homo Uzias, rather than Homo Uzias or later Mono Uzias, who thought that the Son had a like essence of the Father and existed uh, before all things but came from the essence of the Father and proceeded forth from him. And they usually justified this with Proverbs chapter 8. So they weren't Trinitarian, but they certainly were not Muslims. I don't think they call themselves Unitarian. So why is it if the Trinity is not a doctrine found in the Bible, for example, we suddenly have to jump into the religion of Islam? This is kind of an inference to the best explanation or filling in the gaps of storytelling, which you do, which, by the way, is a Greek Western concept, not an Islamic concept. Well, actually, it is an Islamic concept, but it borrowed it from a Greek concept and certainly not some ancient Semitic Jewish concept whatsoever. So simply stating there's a Trinity and there isn't a Trinity, therefore you have to be a Muslim doesn't make any sense. You could just be an Aryan, as people were for 500 years, as tens of millions of people are today while holding both to the New and the Old Testament. So how exactly does that prove Islam? Into the New Testament, you can only find it within Acts. Only in three places within Acts, you can find the word Christian. But uh, Technically, the word Christian is synonymous with Nazarene in the Greek. So you're wrong on that, as are people who say that the word Christian is mentioned in the Bible. It can be inferred from the word which is kind of the root for Nazarene. And Nazarene kind of means the same thing as a Christian, a follower of Christ. 
So the issue here is that Muslims are basing their presupposition or they're presupposing that all religions have to operate the way theirs does. They need a religion where every single thing has to be tied in neatly with only a couple of books within one larger text. They need the names of terms have to all be defined within that text because that's how it works in their religion. But that's not how it works in the Bible. The Bible's three times older than the Quran and it's obviously going to be produced in a different way as it had many different authors. So to say that the Quran has to, or the Bible has to be a reflection of the Quran is actually inaccurate considering the Quran is not the foundation the Bible is built on, but rather the Bible is the foundation that the Quran is built on. So we don't need to presuppose that the religion of the Bible needs to follow the same formula as that of the Quran. That's again, inference to the best explanation. You don't have to fill these gaps with your own explanation at all. That's actually a fallacious way of arguing. Oh, it is Luke, the companion of Paul. Oh, you see this guy? See this guy? Number one bullshit guy. Yes, exactly. Paul, that came up with a fantastic vision of overthrowing the law. Really? We don't follow prophets with fantastic visions? That's quite interesting. Could you maybe recount for us the story of your religious beliefs and where your prophet comes from? <laughs> quite sure the story is a little similar there. Uh, Paul does not actually abolish the law of Moses. And Christians who say that Jesus keeps the law, but Paul abolishes it, so we have to go toward Paul, that's definitely strange. And I would agree with Bobby on that. I have proven in um, my entire law series on my channel that Paul does not abolish the law whatsoever. He merely states that the law is not for salvation. As stated in the letter to the Ephesians, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The last two words are extremely important there. The end of the law for righteousness. Just like when Jesus talks about the golden rule, he doesn't say, treat others as you want to be treated, that's it. He's actually quoted as saying, treat others the way you want to be treated, for this is the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets are implicated in treating others nicely. And the crowd he's talking to are his fellow Israelites, not some Hindu who wants to blow up a church and decapitate people who believe in the biblical God. That's not what Christ was teaching, and abolishing the law is not what Christ nor Paul was teaching. And by the way, as I already pointed out so eloquently to Daniel Hakika too, saying that the Sharia law is analogous with the Mosaic law is basically gibberish. That's like saying Christianity is analogous with Islam, therefore they're the same. But they're not. The Sharia law in many places says things that are diametrically opposite to what is in the law of Moses, which I already covered in that video. So we don't need something similar to the law, we already have the law. We don't need somebody denying the Sabbath when the Sabbath is not part of the law of Moses at all. It's actually a pre-Mosaic natural law that is how God ordered the entire cosmos. So tell us again who has the law and who doesn't, Bobby. Eating pork and stopping circumcision, even though... Paul did not stop circumcision. In Acts chapter 15, verse uh, 1, through to the rest of the beginning, we see that the Pharisees are stating that anybody who does not get circumcised and follow the law of Moses has no salvation. That is not true. The salvation or the salvific element of the law of Moses was only from Moses until Jesus and not any of the prophets before and not any of the prophets after. Paul states quite clearly that we're in a renewed Abrahamic covenant, which talks about in the letter to the Romans and in the letter to the Hebrews. So we're in a renewed Abrahamic covenant based on faith, not based on the meritocracy of the law of Moses. But the law is still active for matters of morality because the New Testament doesn't have a book like Leviticus saying what is good and what is bad. You're supposed to refer to the Old Testament for that. That's why there's no mention of grapes or uh, sexual deviancy with animals, beasts, and other types of things because they have already been covered in the Old Testament. That's why people don't say that we need to go over why murder and theft are wrong. We know why they're wrong from the Old Testament. I already covered all this in my law series. Please check that out. No one's refuted it so far, and they won't. Jesus never mentioned anything like that whilst being on earth. Hence, Actually, he did in Matthew 5, 17, all the way to 21, Christ states that there are some who did not keep the law that will be the least in the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean they won't be there, they'll just be the least compared to the people who kept to the morality of the Torah in a way different than those who ignored it. But there could be people who are saved that did not keep the Torah. That is clearly what Christ said in the most famously quoted verse where people try to attack the Apostle Paul. And Paul states many times that he does not get away with the law. He attacks the rabbinic tradition, as does St. Peter in Acts chapter 10. It's an argument. Luke, the Apostle of Paul, came up with the word Christian and put it into the Bible. Okay, and... Uthman, the apostle and friend of Muhammad, decided arbitrarily which Qur'ans he liked and which Qur'ans he didn't. 
This is silly. We're arguing like atheists here. Let's debate like theologians. Not this nonsense where I don't trust what that guy wrote, he's making up a random word. All of the great Islamic theologians never talked like this. They didn't look at textual criticism, they weren't quoting uh, Sheikh Erman. All they were doing was stating, this is what's in the Quran, this is what we're going to believe, we don't believe in the innovations of the Christians and the Jews. If a modern Muslim who sat on Discord all day talking about textual criticism walked up to Ibn Taymiyyah, they'd probably turn around and say to him, what are you doing? Why are you reading the book of the Christians in the first place? You're not arguing like a classical Muslim, you're arguing like an atheist. This seems like the perfect time to debunk Islam again, and I've made lots of videos on debunk Islam, already. and no Muslim has it's been done. able to offer a good refutation of any of the arguments that I bring up. They just hand wave them. That's what I'm here for, Kyle. I'm not going to just hand wave them. Hey, 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 get that haram tattooed hand away from the camera, buddy boy. You have a Muslim audience history, it says that Moses, Solomon, Abraham, they were all actually Muslims. Even though if you read the Old Testament and Torah, which were written way before the Quran, they show that the theology and worship is literally nothing like Islam. All right, at this point, I really don't know if Christians are just disingenuous or if they really do not get it. They really seem not to grasp the meaning of Muslim. The literal translation of Muslim is someone that submits. A person that submits their will to God. The problem with this word concept fallacy, which Bobby's about to get into, is that he will claim that before the rise of Muhammad, anybody can be a Muslim if they believe in the one God. But today, after Muhammad, you have to be a Muslim based on the creed that you follow. I'm sorry, but religions are creeds. We have a text, we have a theology, we have beliefs. Not just stating that some people have a vague concept of oneness. You know, Plotinus, who the Quran completely apes, as does the rest of Islamic theology, only believed in one God. Does that make him a Muslim? I'm sure you'd like him to be, considering you take so much of his theology, but he's not a Muslim. And if you look at the Jewish prophets, they didn't believe in an ultra-transcendental monad that expanded beyond the uh, categories of existence, who lived in the seventh heaven and could never relate with creation, who's diametrically opposed from the created order eternally, such as Plato's idea of the good being uh, eternally juxtaposed to the rest of uh, creation. There is no concept of that which is found in your religion. So this idea that we have one God means we all have to be the same religion is nonsensical. Otherwise, Buddha could also be a Muslim and many westernized diaspora Muslims will talk like this because it's so easy, there's no parameters stopping them from stating that anybody prior to Muhammad could be a Muslim. By that case, every single Jew in the world today is a Muslim because they don't have any trinity, they're not Trinitarians, as are the Aryans such as the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses. So they are Muslims, why do they need to change their religion whatsoever? I don't see how any of this makes any sense. And again, you're just playing with the word Muslim and saying, well, before my prophet it means this, after it means that. You're not a Muslim unless you follow my religion, except for 90% of history when nobody followed the religion, but we can claim that they're Muslims if we just shrink down the requirement to nothing. It's like saying that I could be the CEO of a company and my only experience on my resume is working at McDonald's. Someone that submits. A person that submits their will to God. To God alone. God. Which God did they submit their will to? Because the Bible is clear that you have to submit your will to Jehovah. It has nothing to do with submitting your will to one God. As I stated in my short, numerics don't matter to the God of the Bible. He doesn't care if you're worshipping five gods, two gods, or one God. If they're the wrong God, they don't count. Monotheism, a Greek term, means nothing to the God of the Hebrews. He wants you to worship him only because he's the only God. Not because oneness is that important to him. There is no line in the Bible that quotes Plotinus saying that God is the one, the absolute. That is rather the Quran. Those people were Muslim. No, we're not saying that those people all spoke Arabic or all of those people actually read the Quran. Yes, you are, actually. If the Quran is an eternal, uncaused, unchanging book, then God was speaking Arabic in heaven before he created everything. So technically, yes, Arabic is a pre-existing language according to uh, your religion. So it's not far-fetched to claim that the prophets all knew Arabic. They must have received it by a divine revelation that is mysteriously missing in the rest of our texts. The Quran. Obviously not, because the Quran was not revealed just then. What we are talking about is the Red Sea. But it was revealed before any of them were born. It wasn't given to men, but it was floating above God in the heavens, but not above God, because he won't admit that God is a concrete deity, which is what the Salafis are aiming for, but they don't have the teeth or the backbone to just get up and say that. So if the Quran is with God eternally, then Arabic was with God eternally. So Arabic is a pre-existing language. 
Obviously not, because the Quran was not revealed just then. What we are talking about is the red threat, the true religion of men. If we look at Adam in the Garden of Eden, he submitted his will to God until he did not submit any longer. He started listening to the devil. So there are just two modes of existence, so to speak, submission to God and rebellion against God. Speaking of, why does the Quran use the wrong word for the tree in that scenario? In any event, if he's not a Muslim anymore because he stopped submitting, what does he become in that scenario? See, I can play games with the words too. I think that's a lousy argument. But that's the kind that you would stoop down to because you're playing with the word concept fallacy. The word Muslim changes throughout time. It depends on who I'm talking about and who I arbitrarily choose to be my prophet. So therefore, dear Christians, nobody here is claiming that Abraham, Noah, Moses, or even Jesus recited Surah Al-Fatiha, for example. So what did they read and what did they recite? They weren't looking at the Quran, were they looking at the Bible? And if they were looking at the Bible, how are they sifting through the various corruptions that you guys believe in? Or did they have an eternal pre-existent book flow down to them, as you claim for the Quran? Which is why the Metazolites are actually superior in terms of that theology. Nevertheless, the Metazolites were massive Neoplatonists, so a curse either way. Not saying that they are doing exactly everything that a Muslim does nowadays. Of course not, because laws have changed. He was a believer. He was someone that submitted his will to God alone. He went so far in his submission to God that he would have sacrificed his firstborn son. And uh, according to your tradition, which son was that exactly? Have you guys reached a conclusion? It's been 1400 years. We're waiting for that. God. Nothing is higher than God. He obeys him and his laws. Which laws? Because a lot of the laws that Abraham and Noah had prior to the Law of Moses are one still found in the Law of Moses. So clearly the Law of Moses is not the first time the laws were revealed. And some of them are natural ordinances, some of them are part of a pre-Mosaic Law Covenant, and others are incorporated from that pre-Mosaic Law Covenant into the Law of Moses. Neither of which you follow. If you read the Old Testament in Torah, which were written way before the Quran, they show that the theology and worship is literally nothing like Islam. The theology that we see the burning bush and theophanies, all of these things, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Yeah, this is an absolutely ridiculous statement, of course, because he wants to talk about continuity. However, he's talking about the Torah. He's talking about the burning bush within the Torah. And those are stories that have been appropriated by the Christians, of course, and then reinterpreted. But they haven't. The difference between how Christians have the Old Testament and how Muslims appropriate prophets is much different. Muslims do not accept the prior revelation, but they do accept the names of the characters and some of their importance and put them in a totally different book in a different context. The Christians and Jews argue over the interpretation of the Old Testament, but they both have the exact same text. Neither of them are claiming your text is corrupt, my text is not. You have Moses of Exodus, I have Moses of the Quran. There is none of that between the Christians and the Jews. We come from the same root, Obviously, we interpret the Bible differently. We're not appropriating something when we acknowledge every single aspect of it, unlike in Islam. Christians truly believe that it was Jesus in the burning bush. That's not true. Only Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox have that belief of the theophany of the angel of the Lord. The Western churches, originally the Latin churches in North Africa and Western Europe, who are the majority today being Catholics and Protestants, actually don't believe in the Old Testament theophany theology. So you're actually talking to a minority here, one that I happen to be a part of, but the point is that you're assuming all of them believe in that theology when they don't. Nevertheless, there is nothing of substance that you're saying here other than the ancients spoke Hebrew, modern Jews are Jews, therefore you have to listen to them. However, if you want to talk about continuity, you would have to ask the Jews, of course, because you want to continue what they started, and you would have to ask the Jews what the real interpretation of the burning bush is. No, we don't, because they don't continue what they started. They began their religion after the fall of the temple, or slightly prior to that with the rank of the Pharisees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are not actually any groups that have authenticity from the Old Testament. All they have, according to Christ in Matthew chapter 23, is the right to teach what already existed, the law of Moses, but not to add their own interpretations of their own practices called the laws of men, mentioned in that same chapter as well as Mark chapter 7, Acts chapter 10, uh, Acts chapter 15, and Romans chapter 14, as well as a variety of other places. So they're not actually the original group, and you're again committing the word concept fallacy here, Bobby, just because someone says they're Jews and the Old Testament was Jewish, therefore it's the same religion. 
So once again, we're committing the word concept fallacy here, Bobby, where you're saying that people who happen to share a similar name or use the name in the same way have to all have the same theology. Not true. There are various brands of Judaism within classical Judaism, the schools that I already mentioned, as well as the Karaites, and of course, groups like the Nazarenes and Judaized groups like the Ebionites and even the Essenes. So which one of them has the true authority? You can't just say it's today's Jews because they have some kind of an ethnic link back to the ancient Jews and claim that they are following the true religion because Christians and Muslims do the same thing. So if you use that logic, we'll never know who's actually the true one. Point is, Christians and Jews have the same root, but then they divulge into different areas, unlike with Islam, which has a different root. So Christians do not owe anything to modern rabbinism, but rather they owe something to the ancient Jews who held the Old Testament. Can't just make the link that because they're Jews, they have to be right about the book. We're not saying that the rabbinics wrote the Bible. That's ridiculous. We're saying the ancient Jews and those prophets wrote the Bible, from which both Christianity and Judaism come from. In fact, it's not inaccurate to say that Christianity, at its root and in its various forms, is a form of Judaism, because it comes from the same exact Jewish core. Jesus even says that salvation is from the Jews, so we're not inventing a brand new Greco-Roman theology out of nowhere, we're getting it from the same root as the rabbinics. And if you talk to Jews, nobody will ever tell you that it was Jesus popping out of that burning bush. Well, people who deny Jesus are not going to believe it was Jesus in the burning bush. That's absolutely fascinating. What you meant to say is find a Judaized non-Trinitarian group to give you their interpretation. Then we have something similar, because at least we both have the same Messiah which you guys don't. No, it was God's way of communication with the prophets. What you're doing now is taking that Jewish document yet again and trying to bend it into your Trinitarian worldview. Again, why can't you just be an Aryan then? Be a Jewish Aryan. Why? If, you, if Bobby has disproven the entire Christian system and the Trinity with this magnum opus of his, why don't we just become Jewish Aryans? Why on earth do we have to become Muslims? Appeal to ignorance. I like metaphysics of how they view God. He obviously hasn't read the Quran in the first place, otherwise he wouldn't come up with such an argument to begin with. Because the burning bush story, as I said, is within the Jewish scriptures, Christians appropriated those stories. No, they didn't already examine that. Uh, what you're doing is appropriating. Christians and Jews have the same root. You're taking a story that's in a book you reject as authentic, and now you're putting it in your book. That is the definition of appropriating scripture. Therefore, you would have to pre-assume, of course, that the Torah, the Bible are correct and that the Muslims actually believe what is written within the Bible and within the Torah that we find nowadays. But we do not. But you do. Because otherwise there's no justification to even have a character named Moses in your Quran. Moses doesn't appear anywhere else. The origin of Moses is in the Torah. So if you're saying the Torah cannot be trusted, then the character of Moses cannot be trusted. So now you're just putting a character who's popular in the Middle East into the book and saying, we have the true Moses. True according to who? The Torah, which is the origin of the character of Moses? No, not according to the Torah, according to the historical Moses. But there's no existence or proof of an existence of a Moses outside of the Torah. The Torah is all we have to work with. So when you take the story of Exodus, at least in most of its parts, and put it in the Quran and say, we have the true Moses, you do not have the true Moses because you reject the place that Moses is found in. So how do we even know who Moses is? If the Torah and the New Testament and everything else is corrupt, let's say I'm a pagan in Iran, and you come up to me with the Quran saying, this is the word of God because it, it's the true revelation. And I say, I don't care about the Torah. I don't care about the rest of the Tanakh. And I don't care about the New Testament. Why should I follow your book? Uh, it's the true word of God and it's the true way of Moses. But if I'm an Iranian pagan, I don't care about Moses. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. You don't care about Moses because you don't care about the origin of this character as you would say. Yeah, go figure. If we look at the Bible, I concede, of course, because we find descriptions of pure monotheism and then we find polytheism. With no, you don't already dealt with the Elohim issue multiple times. You and Daniel Hakikachu, clearly illiterate and have not never opened blue letter Bible in your life. It's quite evident in uh, the book of Genesis, for example, when Laban the Syrian is pursuing Jacob, that uh, Rachel hides the gods of Laban and it uses the word Elohim. It doesn't say fake gods, it just says the gods of Laban. So she hides them and stows them away, but they're clearly lifeless, inanimate objects. And later, when Elijah is talking about the Gal Baal Hadad, he defeats the uh, the challengers against God and proves that God is the only one who exists. That's the whole moral of the story. Go read First Kings. It's not that hard. We can see that there are other gods believed by people, but they don't exist. They're fake, and they cannot answer. That's why Elijah says that the God Baal Hadad. The Canaanites are worshipping must be sleeping or busy because he cannot answer the call of his own people. 
So, as I said earlier, those Canaanites would be monotheists and Muslims, according to you, because they only had that one God. Some of them did say there was a consort, some tried to mix it with the Lord Almighty of Judaism of its time, but many of them, at least in this scenario, only worshipped Baal Hadad. But they're Muslims, so Elijah shouldn't have slaughtered them. So you're just appropriating the story here. And you're also, again, assuming that there are these characters, Moses, Jesus, David, and Solomon, and all these others, who exist independently of the writings reported of them. Which is not the case if you're doubting the Bible itself. Then if there is no Torah, there is no nothing, we don't believe that th th this book is from God, then we really have no reason to even believe in characters like Solomon, Moses, and Jesus in the first place. So why do they show up in your book? Completely arbitrary. You're doing the exact same thing against Kyle, but it works against your favor, Bob. And how Solomon and Abraham and all these people were worshiping with a priesthood and the temple with a sacrifice, Islam does not have any of that. Orthodox Christianity has all of that. Yeah, this is absolutely amazing because he just debunked himself by mentioning Abraham. Obviously, during the time of Abraham, there was no priesthood. But really, then uh, why does he encounter Melchizedek? Like, it's like it's like they don't even read. Which they don't, because they claim the book's corrupt in the first place. So let's continue. Nor was there a temple. As I stated already, he is the perfect example of somebody that submitted his will to God. Nothing was more important to him. However, he had no liturgical service. He had no baptism whatsoever. No concept of Jesus even. He surely did not pray to the Trinity. Again, why don't we just be Jewish Aryans by your logic? None of this is an argument for Islam. You're just arguing against Trinitarianism as a subject. You can still be a believer in the New Testament, even call yourself a Christian or some variants of the word, and not have to be a Muslim. None of these are arguments for Muslims. Muslims constantly think that if they debunk the Trinity, you have to become Muslim, but that's not at all true whatsoever. Uh, again, with Melchizedek, I already mentioned, but uh, what you're doing here is you're basically saying that none of the elements of the Old Testament matter because they weren't all there from the beginning. So then why does it matter if the Sharia law is similar to the Mosaic law at all? Why does it matter if Paul even keeps the law of Moses if you're so comfortable abrogating things like alcohol in the first place? If Muhammad can abrogate alcohol and some of the dietary supplemental rules found in Leviticus, as well as much of the rest of the law of Moses, including the natural ordinance, the Sabbath, which is not part of the law of Moses, but is simply a natural cyclical calendar that is how God ordered the universe, then why can't Paul get rid of the law? Which he doesn't, but according to your logic, he could, because your prophet did plenty of abrogations. Um, at the same time, you're basing your entire idea of continuity just on theology alone. But as Kyle so rightly stated, none of the way you worship follows anything in the Bible. You're making all of this about the Trinity. I've yet to see one way where Islam actually follows the way of worshiping God that is found in the Bible. I'm not talking about theology, Unitarian, Arian, whatever, versus Trinity. That's not the discussion here. What now I'm discussing is how come the manner of worship is not the same. For example, the animal sacrifices are mentioned vaguely in the Quran, but if Jesus is not the substitutionary atonement which saves us from our sin, defeats death, which is Christus Victor, by trampling it down and shattering Hades and allowing everybody to have eternal life via the salvation through Christ, and replacing the animal sacrifice system of the Old Testament, then why aren't Muslims doing the animal sacrifice system? And I don't mean only once a year. I mean consistently, as the Bible says to because the punishment for sin is always death. And so if it's not your death and it's not Jesus Christ's death, why aren't you sacrificing animals? You don't come from the same tradition. So anything other than vague monotheism is not similar at all to Islam. Priesthood, etc., etc. Where is the continuity of singular monotheism in Christianity? There's no response to that. Where is the continuity with circumcision? There's no response to that. Where is the continuity with a dietary law? There's no response to that. Where is the continuity with prostration? There's no response to that. Exactly. I already said that Paul does not get rid of circumcision. He just says that your circumcision becomes uncircumcision if you're going to flounder around on the law, not take it seriously and be a hypocrite, or try to replace the salvation given to us by Christ with the meritocracy of the law. Circumcision is not gone, but it is not the way that you enter into the covenant, which is actually by baptism. So baptism becomes the new circumcision. And our baptism is found in the Old Testament. It's the same word, baptismo, used in the Greek for the Septuagint uh, for the Levitical priest. So it is not something invented in the New Testament. But as we can see in your words, there would be a slight abrogation where baptism is now the way you enter the covenant, just as Islam abrogated the majority of the Bible. 
alcohol within Islam became haram in the early days of Islam, in the early days of the revelation of the Quran, which took 23 years, alcohol was still permissible. It was taken away slowly from the people. The reason given for that in the Quran is that if the law would have been revealed in one day, nobody would have been able to follow it. Really? So the law of Moses cannot be followed? It was revealed in pretty quick amount of time. Maybe not in a 24 hour span as you have dictated here, but within a span of uh, weeks and months, people were already doing. And Psalm 119 is an entire poem about how great the law of Moses is. So clearly it was not an impossible task to do. Matthew chapter 23, Christ says that the Pharisees lay up burdens upon the law and make it impossible to follow. Not that the law itself is bad. And even Paul says the commandment is just and holy. And in Romans, I believe chapter 7, Paul states that without the law, we wouldn't know sin. So the law is not impossible. The law was revealed in a very short amount of time. And people, for the most part, followed it until there were moments of lapse in pagan idolatry, which is quite common in the Old Testament. But not because the law was so hard, but because the people were hard. Therefore, there is a sort of progressive revelation within the Quran as well. First, alcohol was permissible, even during the time of the Prophet in the early years. Oh, and another, oh, progressive revelation. What you mean is the progress of humanity, because like Darwin, you believe in evolution. To prove that, I'm going to state quite clearly here that if you think humanity progresses naturally without any need for God's law or God's guidance, then you essentially believe in what is called the evolution of man, which is what the Platonic school of philosophy taught. And that's why they taught that you had this chain of being and everybody existed in this orb wherein God surrounded all of creation. And so within the orb, you had to be raised from this part of the orb up to the top on the chain of being. They also spoke of the fact that uh, categories of description merited ontological existence. And so if you have this idea that categories of description have ontological existence, and you also have the idea that humanity progresses over time, thus believing in evolution, you have aped, as Darwin did, the transcendental unity of apperception that was actually coined by Pythagoras himself in his description of how reality operates. Nothing in the Bible says that men just happen to progress naturally without any help or guidance from God whatsoever. But somehow, 613 laws were really easy to do, but alcohol was just so difficult for these pagan people and ancient Jews to ever get a hold on that kind of theology. Total gibberish. And then in the end he says, he is the son of God, he is God. No, he is not, because according to Jewish scripture, this was never mentioned. Nobody was waiting for the son of God to come. Really, I guess you haven't read um, Psalm 2, Proverbs chapter 30, or Psalm 22, which are quite obvious examples of God having a son. And all of those Psalms and Proverbs are, at least in those sections, messianic. Especially Psalm 22, which is quoted by Christ as he is on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the rest of it is all about him. It even says that he has been pierced in his hands and his feet. This is clearly about Jesus Christ, as is Isaiah chapter 53. This idea that there is no son of God anywhere in the Old Testament is just Islamic gibberish that has nothing to do with the Jewish scriptures. This idea that I have to say that Islam is closer because it's an Arabic religion and the Jews are Semitic, so they're close to uh, the Arabs, is total nonsense. Most of the enemies of the Jews were fellow Semites and their cousins, the Hamites, also known as Kemetic people. So they weren't fighting Indo-Aryans most of the time until later of the events in the Old Testament. Somebody speaking a somewhat similar language does not mean that you're similar enough to conduce that your theology is going to be the same. Islam is actually a Greek religion, it's not a Jewish one. You have no idea of Jewish theology because you're obsessed with oneness and Greek terms like monotheism. It is Plotinus who cares about oneness. It is not the God of the Bible that cares about oneness. Deuteronomy 6 says that the Lord is one Lord. He is only one Lord, there's no other Lords because he is the only Lord for the Israelites. He does not copy Plotinus where it says he is the one, the absolute. Nowhere in the Bible is God called the one on a definitive existential way. Oneness is not some kind of a mysterious attribute that the God of the Bible cares about. And yet it is the only thing that Muslims claim is necessary to have a link to the ancient prophets. It has nothing to do with classical Judaism whatsoever. 
Nobody was waiting for a literal God to incarnate. I already gave you the description of the Messiah. And it was destroyed. So the Messiah had to come. And the Messiah is God incarnate. It doesn't yeah. make any sense that Jesus, the Messiah, was a Muslim. And we hear that, oh, he was a Muslim because he did prostrations. Drunk? It still doesn't matter whether he's God incarnate or not. You disagreeing on that point has nothing to do with the argument that you have to become Muslim. Again, you can just be a Jewish Aryan. You do not need to become a Muslim. I don't understand how there's this, you're wrong, therefore I'm right. That's not how people argue, that's inference to the best explanation. Try again, appeal to ignorance. Because he worshiped like Muslims. Okay, where did the Muslims get prostrating in prayers from? Again, Islam came in the 600s. They were just copying from Christians that were doing prostrations. All Islam did was take from Christianity and rabbinical Judaism in the Talmud. Now, unfortunately, they copied from heretical Neoplatonic Christians as well, which is why so much Neoplatonism found its way into the Quran and Islamic theology, such as the extreme Platonic dualism of the disincarnate soul, such as the ultra-transcendental monad of Plotinus, such as this monotheism that they care so much about. They assume all of these things are Jewish because they saw some sophist Christian philosophers who were exiled to the desert talking about them. It doesn't mean that's what Christianity or the Old and New Testaments are actually about. The same applies to the Jews. The Jews were doing things that had been invented hundreds of years after they were already judged in the time of the New Testament with the destruction of the Temple, the exiled diaspora of the Jewish people, and the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so when they are talking about things found in the Talmud, which is copied almost word for word into the Quran in multiple instances, they assume that this is classical Judaism. And they assume that Neoplatonic heresy is classical Christianity. And that is one of the hallmarks of it being a false belief system. Also, Bobby, I love the fact that I was in Kyle's video, approximately a third of it, one of the most viewed theology videos on the internet at this time, at least for the last eight months or so, you haven't responded to a single thing I've said. Is it because you cannot respond to my arguments? As if 600 years in terms of revelation is a long time. Actually thinking of which for Christians, it probably is a long time because they believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. Citation needed that it's any older than that, Bobby. You're now appealing both to Plato and to a variety of other Greek-inspired modern scientists. Uh, it's Plato who deduced that the Earth is spherical because God has to be spherical for all of creation to fit inside of him, operating off of the system of Pythagoras, of course. And thus, if God is a sphere, creation, which he is eternally next to, because material itself was eternal according to Plato, had to mimic the sphericity of its creator. Thus, the world has to be a circular globe. Thus, the world has to be ancient and eternal, because the good is the ancient and eternal. You are not a Semitic follower of a Semitic religion. You are not following classical Judaism. Islam is not following Judaism. You are following Greek philosophers. This is gibberish. But this evidence that we found not only contradicts that, but proves that the Bible was correct when the Bible told us that God made man and dinosaurs together. Actually, the dinosaur tissue is living, according to a great documentary I watched, is Genesis History and a variety of papers that I've read on it. And all of the evidence that the Earth has to be tens of billions of years old are based on abduction, so inference to the best explanation or filling in gaps of knowledge. If you presuppose that God doesn't exist and the Bible is wrong, then you will naturally conclude at some point that the Earth has to be older than what the Christians and the Jews were saying. Based on all of that, uh, I find it impossible to say that dinosaur tissue can be alive after 75 to 85 to 95 million years, being constantly scorched and frozen again and again and again in places like Arizona and other areas. Also, there's a mountainous uh, amount of knowledge and uh, evidence for the global flood, which again, you guys are going to ignore because you don't care about anything that happened in the Old Testament. You only care about plucking your armpit hairs the way your prophet did. But anyways, as usual, they're not looking into their own doctrine, of course. Your own doctrine subscribes to progressive revelation through the church fathers that are allegedly guided by the Holy Spirit. So no matter what Jesus said, then you have those saints that come after him, the holy church fathers, such as Saint Paul, and then they tell you, hey, well, Jesus never mentioned eating pork, but well, now I can because I am guided by the Holy Spirit. You have just the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church 
by which I believe St. Justin Martyr said that there would come people who are incorrect that would claim that they're only receiving the voice of the Spirit and were not following the Bible. So your attack would make sense if we were attacking papism, which we're not. We're talking about the veracity of the Old and New Testament. You have to separate the Old New Testament from later church tradition if you're going to be attacking only the Old New Testament. It has nothing to do with anything. You're saying, Kyle, you can't follow the Bible because it's something a Catholic said in the 1400s. They can eat pork because they're guided by the Holy Spirit. They claim they can eat pork based on a misinterpretation of the 7th chapter of Mark, as well as a misinterpretation of the beginning of the 10th chapter of Acts, which I covered in my video. So your problem is not with the New Testament. Now you have a problem with Christian tradition. So if the competition is between Kyle versus Christian tradition versus Islam, then I guess you have a reason to debate, but aren't you supposed to be responding to Kyle's video against Islam? Which you're not doing. You're just saying, I'm taking what you're saying and I'm applying it towards some tradition that you have 700 years later. How are you exactly objective? Christ comes to earth, circumcises himself even, but hey, let's forget about it. Let's send Paul and let's tell them that circumcision is wrong, even though your God was circumcised. Paul did not say circumcision is wrong. He said your circumcision is nothing if you're using the law as a meritocracy to salvation. Christ is how you are saved and we're living in a renewed Abrahamic covenant. Does not mean that the law is actually gone. Read Matthew 5, uh, 17 to 21, Acts chapter 10, Romans chapter 14, Acts chapter 15, verse 21, where St. James says quite clearly that the Gentiles are going to follow these prerequisite laws, which he's basing off the Torah. And then after that, he says, for Moses is read aloud in the synagogue every single Sabbath. So you're actually wrong on the New Testament. So if you're claiming the church fathers were all wrong, you're more wrong than they are. So you're not exactly helping the issue here by misinterpreting something for 2,000 years and then going, oh, well, we have a different book. A book that's fixing the issues that weren't in the New Testament to begin with. If the all-knowing God composed the Quran, wouldn't he point out, hey, Christians, you're actually misinterpreting Mark and Acts and Romans and all these other areas? Why doesn't he point that out? Why doesn't the Quran actually use what's in the Bible to say what is correct and what's not? Why do I, thousands of years later, have to stumble upon this information and give it to you? Am I superior then to the people who've brought you your theology? That Jesus has a problem with in the Mosaic Law, a problem that many people say he does, which he doesn't. He actually just refers to stuff that was already a law before the Law of Moses, such as looking at uh, the issue of divorce, which is commonly misinterpreted, and when looking at the rabbinic tradition, which is what he attacks all the time, such as in Mark chapter 7. He's talking about the hand-washing ritual that the Pharisees invented. He's not saying out of nowhere, the clear blue sky, that people should just be eating pork for absolutely no reason. Again, if your all-knowing God wrote your book, wouldn't he point that out? Wouldn't that be a lot easier than these debates for the last 1400 years? The word that you can find is in Geel. We believe in the revelation that has been sent down to Jesus. This is what we believe in. At the same time, and this is what the Quran confirms as well, we believe that the scriptures have been tampered with. And there is a track record of that. If you look back into the Jewish times, if you look back to the Pharisees, even into Talmudic Judaism, etc. Actually, the famous line often misquoted by Muslims from the book of Jeremiah talks about people in that day tampering with it, not the people from the time of Moses onward tampering with it. That's not whatsoever found anywhere in the Bible. Only the people immediately around Jeremiah who is essentially a man alone against those who were against God. Same as with Elijah. But at the same time, the Torah was preserved. You guys talk about oral tradition all the time and how you have to memorize the Quran. But the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, states that the fathers need to be teaching their sons Torah. And unless you're going to somehow make the fantastical claim that everybody was literate and could write perfectly in Paleo-Hebrew, then they would have been memorizing it in Paleo-Hebrew and continuing that for generations. So the Quran asserts that this is exactly what has happened, that wicked men have manipulated your scriptures. Like Uthman did for yours? Do we believe in the pure revelation of the Torah and the Injil? Yes, we do. And what language is the Injil written in? Because you're all going to say Aramaic, but it's clear that it would have been, hypothetically, written in Hebrew, as three out of the four Gospels were likely written in Hebrew, according to Eusebius, Irenaeus, Polycarp, Papias, Clement, uh, we can see that the letter to the Hebrews, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and of course, by relation, parts of the Gospel of Mark, and parts of the Gospel of John also were. There are many instances of uh, Paul speaking Hebrew. You know, a guard walks up to Paul, asks him if he knows any Greek, which really makes no sense if he's already speaking Greek, and then Paul goes to speak to his people in their tongue, and it says the Hebrew tongue, and he speaks to them in Hebrew. So Hebrew is not a dead language. You need to get this E. Michael Jones theology out of your brain. Do we believe that you have 
the pure Injil and that the Jews have the pure Torah? No, we do not. There's absolutely no indication anywhere other than the Quran that arbitrarily decides what is and what isn't the truth of there ever being an Injil. Jesus never talks about receiving a book from God. He states that he's come in the Father's will. He's on the Father's will on earth, doing the will of the Father, fulfilling the Old Testament, which he has memorized because he just speaks them. He doesn't have to go and refer to the Injil. There's no reference to that. And if you say, well, that's the Bible, it's corrupt, as I already stated, there is no point in even saying Jesus is part of the Quran if you're denying the book in which this character originates from. If we're going to be speaking like secular people and secular historians, which is how all Muslims argue nowadays, then the character of Jesus only appears in the work of the New Testament, and to say that there's a Jesus outside of that New Testament is basically fan fiction. I didn't know you were a fan of Reza Aslan. And it preaches a different gospel, let them be anathema. And that's the exact situation that Muhammad was in. A quote-unquote angel came and revealed this. So why would we do that when everything, even the Quran, is saying to listen to the Bible? Yeah, and also Galatians as well, which I believe Kyle mentions, or did mention at least in a previous video. Quite easy, you know, if anyone else comes with a different gospel, you don't listen to him. For verily, Satan can take the form of an angel of light. That sounds kind of familiar. And then, of course, uh, Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet, is all about Islam. And we can get into that in another video, but one of the most important details is that it says the army that is going to be coming from the east of Egypt, the army of locusts, symbolically that meant Arabia in the Old Testament, uh, will be told to torment for five months, which translates to 150 years in biblical prophecy. And they will be told not to harm anything green or cut down any trees, which is exactly what the law of Sharia tells us. So uh, the Bible knows exactly what Islam is, and it knows there's going to be a religion like that, and it calls it out for what it is. Why don't you do what Jesus did? Why don't you get circumcised? Why do you eat pork? We're assuming that Kyle eats pork and is not circumcised, and why you're getting into the, the details of another man's life who you know only vaguely through the internet. The point is, what does that have to do with Islam? Somebody not following Jesus properly, hypothetically, has nothing to do with Islam. Oh, you're attacking my religion? Why don't you follow your religion? Oh, great. Brilliant argument. I suppose I should take my shahada now. You've called someone a hypocrite that you don't even know, therefore your religion's right. What is this? Why don't you pray with your head on the ground as Jesus did? The Jews also prayed upward toward the sky, which in Islam is actually a haram thing to do while praying your mandatory prayers. You can't pray like this toward the sky. But that is what Jesus and many of the Jewish prophets did. You do not follow Jesus, you follow your church fathers. Okay, and you do not worship the one God, you worship the monad. <laughs> I mean, seriously though, you don't. So anybody can use these arguments. Like, you don't worship God, you worship the monad. You don't follow the Jewish prophets, you follow the Greek prophets. That's true, you do. Are you guys confused Plotinus with Aristotle for like 800 years as well? Now about the whole age of Aisha topic in a nutshell because it is a very long topic. I don't care about the age of Aisha topic at all. It has nothing to do with anything and it's not Christians who are putting too much emphasis on it. It's Muslims who care about it. If you just didn't care and moved on and said, hey, if our religion is right, then it doesn't matter what God prescribes, then yeah, that, that would be totally fine if you prove your religion is right. But you haven't. So like, you're the ones putting all this emphasis on this because you care about universal morality. You're trying to make everything moral based on the Western system of universal morality. Which states, by the way, that there is a morality which exists above God holding him accountable. And that, St. Paul says, is gibberish because in Romans chapter 9, God is right because God is might, not because there is universal morality floating above him. So maybe if you guys stopped caring about universal morality, you would be closer to the Jewish prophets you claim you're emulating. We're talking about Surah Al Maida. The Jews say the hand of Allah is fettered. It is their own hands which are fettered, and they stand cursed for the evil they have uttered. No, his hands are outspread. He spends as he wills. So first and foremost, there is no mention of two right hands here within the Quran at all. And moreover, the Ashari or the Maturidi interpretation of this would be, of course, that the Jews say that Allah is not generous. His hands are fettered. However, no, his hands are outspread. This is metaphorical for Allah being generous. Really? It's metaphorical? Then what do you have to say about the countless neo-Salafis that are on the internet? Or the fact that the Bible speaks of God in terms of his concrete existence? So you don't believe in a God that exists. 
You believe in a transcendental monad that is beyond the categories of all existence and cannot even be compared to anything because he's eternally juxtaposed creation just as Plato said that he was. And if you actually look at, uh, um, what's his name? Ibn al-Az and his commentary of Imam al-Tahawi, he says quite clearly that uh, God does not exist. Because if God existed, he would be within a category that is unbefitting of his majesty. So to get away from what you see as barbaric polytheism, believing in a concrete deity, you now admit that God doesn't exist. God is just an ontological concept in your head. You're bald, un-Torah-like head. Thank you guys for watching. Hope that was quite decent for you. I'm going to be taking a little bit of hiatus from the channel briefly um, and just from Discord in general so you can talk to some of the people that I've trusted with the authority to uh, repeat some theology and help with polemical arguments. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And check out Kyle's original video, which even though I was in one third of that video, Bobby has done absolutely nothing to respond to a single argument that I have made. Thank you all and God bless.